Hello and welcome everybody to the first episode of Hardware Radar. Yes, this is the first episode and it might need some introduction, but I don't want to waste anybody's time here, so I will give myself less than a minute for this. In this format, I want to bombard you with the info of whatever new tech hardware or even software release has happened in the week before. The goal of Hardware Radar is not to talk about the newest leak of the same GPU for 12 weeks straight until Nvidia steps in and cuts out half the VRAM. No, I want this to be more new nuanced into smaller releases. Of course, including big and really, really important ones, we still need the clicks, but I'm also maintaining a giant ass Google spreadsheet of every manufacturer under the sun that might release something cool and I'm periodically scanning their websites to find whatever they just released. If I forgot something, or I don't know about something, or you just want to make sure that whatever piece of hardware is covered or manufacturer is covered, feel free to comment down below, and I do read every single comment on this channel. Or as a manufacturer, we have a dedicated press email that you can use to just spam us full of whatever USB docking station you are throwing onto the market next. That was a minute, let's get going. Starting off with the clickbait milk of this episode, in a twist that surprised no one, Nintendo finally revealed that there is going to be a successor to the Switch, and this time it's black. In a short trailer that showed how a bunch of 3D animators can morph a Switch 1 into a Switch 2, we got a first glimpse of what to expect. Like a bigger screen, a way less colorful exterior, a stand that doesn't look like it's going to break just by looking, and for me the most exciting part, a button to release the Joy-Cons looking way, way less annoying than what we had before, but that might also be a problem that are that is exclusive to like sausage finger people. And the highlight of the press release, Switch 1 games will work on the Switch 2. What a relief. Now let's just hope that Nintendo doesn't pull the same dick move that Sony did with the PS3, like yeah, hardware limitations, yeah. For now, there is not much more to tell, but Nintendo already announced a Nintendo Direct presentation for the 2nd of April, where we will see how low that stand actually goes. Over at Silverstone, we got a whole bunch of stuff, like the new SATA H2 and SATA H2M2 cases that on the first glance seem identical, one just being like a tad blacker, but actually M stands for something like medium because the non-M H2 can fit a whole bunch more. Both are aimed for the workstation prosumer market and come in a appropriate design, let's say, featuring a whole lot of black metal, but with that 2025 twist of we now know that PC stuff needs air. The front of the case is almost entirely made out of a mesh panel and travels across the left and right side panel. The right side panel is nothing new, we've got sidewise intake for years now, but these things can fit some hardware. The smaller one is a bit less impressive, with up to 350mm long GPUs and 8 SSDs or 3 three and a half inch hard drives, but the bigger one can fit up to 420mm long GPUs, so basically everything you can find, and up to 15 two and a half inch or three and a half inch drives, 15. Of course, at the cost of the sidewise intake, but this thing has power for so many drives, I know server chassis that can't compete with that. I, I just still haven't figured out what the left side mesh is for. Like, so far, it's just there to, to be there. Then we got the Lucid 04, a case that has many design similarities to the Montex Sky case. It's got some glass in the front and side and the mesh ventilated bottom port. And here we got the same idea for its bottom to, to top airflow path, where the fans on top of the PSU shroud are supposed to become actually useful for once as they are pulling air from within the PSU shroud, assisted by all the meshiness around. If that can make these fans actually useful remains to be seen, but something that is definitely useful by default is the new Silverstone FHS 140X, a 140mm fan, 38mm thick, pushing up to 3400 RPM. The imagery is already portraying it in the server chassis, so you know where this road is heading, but this thing is as dangerous as fans can be. It is protected by a fan grill, because otherwise that thing will just shred through your fingers, it's, it's incredible. And the stats state that this thing can push up to 223 CFM at up to 10 mm of H2O. Absolutely insane stats, and so are the 50 dBA noise level, which knowing how truthful the noise level numbers usually are, this thing will probably blow eardrum. But what makes this thing actually special or interesting is the usage of LCP, or at least on the impeller. The frame is just regular old PBT. 
Definitely an interesting fan. I will request it as soon as I got a minute. I just hope that I can make it spin slow enough so that it doesn't hurt my neighbor's ears. And again from Silverstone, yeah, I, I told you a surprising amount of Silverstone news. In, in a total twist of events, Silverstone went back, like way back. The FLP01 is a retrofitted chassis. It features universal drive cage design compatible with two and a half inch, three and a half inch, and five and a quarter inch drives. Well, it says drives, but actually what they mean is retro optical drive and floppy disk base. Yeah, floppy disk in 2025. I knew that there was a whole subculture forming right now around the whole floppy disk thing, but yeah, there you go, floppy disk subreddit. You got a new case. To retrofit this, it seems like Silverstone just used their Grandia 11 case as a base, or at least the imagery suggests that, because I had the Grandia on the table like, like about a month ago, so I remember how it's looking from the inside, and this is basically a Grandia. Of course, with a few twists to make the whole floppy disk happen, but yeah, if you always wanted a brand new case, which got that like 90s compact design, there you go. And again, Silverstone, but let's just rush through this one. I'm not making like a Silverstone episode here. The Nova Peak 240 and 360. Yeah, there isn't really much to tell about. It's all black and a tad of white LED, but for some reason, dual ball bearing fans. So I'm just not sure why this exists yet. Coming to Montag and their heritage case. In the press release, they used way too many buzzwords and way too many adjectives. But other than the case looking interesting, it's a smaller sized up to micro ATX case that is somehow capable of fitting a 360 red. The special sauce comes in form of a whole lot of leather. It exists in black and white and can be upgraded with a leather carrying strap that doubles as a headphone holder, which if you like that, cool. Without actual images instead of just 3Ds, I'm not sure how this blend of luxurious leather and durable metal does for me, but for the spec sheet it looks nice. And of course that gorgeous looking Montag price tag. Speaking of designs I may not be able to handle, Cooler Master. In a collaboration nobody asked for, Cooler Master is now making air coolers with a top cap representing a V-type engine block. This leaves me with two very important questions. Who came up with this? and why. For now there is very little said about the cooler. All we know is that there are four models, a V4, V6, V8 and V10. Cooler Master created and patents uh, something they call 3D HP technology, something that seems to describe both vertically and horizontally stacked heat pipe blocks, or in other words a extra heat pipe that sits directly above the CPU's hotspot, which is Easier said than done considering that AMD and Intel have vastly different hotspot locations and shapes, but based on the little information we got, this could potentially do really great on at least Intel, given that it, it at least looks like that central heat pipe will be sitting above the complete die. But we will know more about this once these things get released. As said before, there will be several models. All of them seem to be featuring a dual 120mm fan setup, and the V8 and V10 models should be dual towers with the strongest one potentially capable of cooling down up to 340 watts of Cooler Master's interpretation of what TDP stands for today. For now, the release date is set for March, definitely one of the more interesting releases of the year, and I'm looking forward to all the redneck jokes I will be making about the design. And before you ask, I don't know if the V number corresponds to the amount of heat, or the total amount of heat pipes, but it would be so freaking cool. Like a 10 heat pipe cooler, where one of them would be in the center, so you got like a, a 9 plus 1, and you could say you got like one performance or P heat pipe and nine efficiency heat pipes like E heat pipes and yeah maybe I should stop writing Cooler Master's copy here. In other news we got the Cooler Master Encore 100, a small form factor case designed to streamline PC building and upgrading, the usual copy. It's set to debut in the first quarter of this year and it features a dual chamber design with the motherboard and PSU sitting on one half of the case whilst the GPU takes up the other half. The case being as high as it is allows for some relatively impressive GPU compatibility considering its overall volume and if you are nice to it it will grow. Originally it comes at just below 15 liters but by doing some case magic you can push that up to 16.4 liters probably also improving the overall compatibility in the process. And just because we just switched over from the V8 coolers, this thing actually looks good for a change. Over at Fantex, we got a new M25 Gen 2 120mm fan. We had the original M25 here uh, for a review, very okay fan, more red than case, but it did a fine job for the, a somewhat okay price. 
This new Gen 2 seems to be an improvement on every end, a bit more rubber here, sturdier looking frame there, but the thing that actually might be cool is we got a daisy chain cable system on one end and a screw in system to fix the whole block on the other one. Not sure how well this expansion system holds on compared to something like Li and Li, which is the block is already very sturdy on in a, a Li and Li fan configuration, but I'm definitely looking forward to this one. The M25 Gen 2 can already be found on a cooler, notably the Glacier 1360 M25 G2. Yeah, I know it's it sounds exactly like the horrific naming schemes of the newer BMWs. Anyway, we got a 27mm radiator with a regular 25mm fan, so nothing out of the ordinary except for the integrated VRM fan hidden within the block and pump combo. And Andor 5 finally goes international. Accompanied by a announcement that they are now sending their stuff in the US, they also repainted a whole bunch of their coolers. The Farrah 5 and Fortis 5 now come in black with or without RGB, but other than the paint, it doesn't seem like there is any other difference to the original ones. And to end this episode, we got a brand new AIO-like looking thing from Ice Giant, which is entering pre-order and should be delivered by June 2025. And this thing is going to be so special. Ice Giant was the company who created the Pro Siphon Elite, the first gravity-driven cooler using a thermal siphon. Incredibly interesting stuff and cooled amazingly under certain circumstances, one of which was somehow fitting that thing into a case. And these guys are now coming out with the Ice Giant Titan 360, a 360 millimeter AIO-like looking version of that thing. There is very little known about this, no reviews or benchmarks to be found yet, but they got this hilarious graph saying air coolers and high performance is just straight up no. Just no, screw you D15, just no. And the new Pro Siphon with flex form is just yes on every possible aspect, like performance independent of CPU architecture, which is quite the bold claim considering nobody knows uh, what AMD will come up with next or how a uh, Intel is going to screw up next. You, you never know. Anyway, similarly to the original Thomas Siphon Cooler, there are no fans, no moving parts, no pump, nothing. A completely passive loop if you ignore the fans, which is also the reason why this thing has a lifetime warranty, except for the fans, of course. But I guess what moves can also break. Compared to the Pro Siphon, this thing is very, very different. As I said, it looks like a 360mm AIO with some sort of movable tube or flexible tube system, which means that we now got a hugely improved compatibility list towards cases. Like the, the, the original one, incompatible AF, you, you basically needed a test bench to, to mount that thing, but this, this could do it. But the reason why this thing is bold AF, 414 euros, a 414 euros cooler. Oh, you want to cool down a thread ripper? That's going to be 592, please. I can get a used VW Golf 4 for that price. A completely worn down and one with a disgusting smell and unidentifiable stains. Or a Mac Mini. You can get a Mac Mini for the price of a cooler. Bold, bold AF. The air cooler looking like original Pro Siphon was at least within the range of a Nokia NHD 15. But this, I am hella looking forward to see how they justify this pricing. And this was pretty much it for all the hardware releases or announcements of the last week or weeks, considering this is the first episode. If I missed anything or if you want a company to be added to the radar, just tell me down below or if you have an opinion on this, I have thick skin. And for this series, I'm planning to do this on a weekly basis or bi-weekly if there just aren't enough releases to talk about. But let's try this for two, maybe three months and we will just see where things are going. Oh, on a side note, we have a Discord server. So if you want to join, the link is down below. And we got channel membership. So if you are planning to sell your soul for an RG poop emoji, that's one way to go. But if not, I'm also releasing the content to all members two or three weeks in advance. Except for the NDA stuff, because, you know, I, I don't want to get sued. Additionally, can rest assured that the income will not only keep the channel afloat, but it will also serve to get a financial expert to explain this to me. I just can't wrap my head around this pricing. Anyway, thank you for watching and hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.